There was once a time when the universe, plants, animals, men and gods were the same thing. There was once a time when men considered illumination the highest level of consciousness. To reach illumination, they fasted, they flagellated themselves, and they retired to meditate on the highest summits of the world or in the deepest caves. To illuminate their minds and to find the key which would allow them to penetrate the infinite, they experimented all of the instruments that great Mother Earth provided them with. Ascetics and all men in search of illumination from the Siberian steppes to the African jungles and from the South American deserts to the forests of the Old World have once used the power plants as mediums to reach the infinite. They consider them as keys which would have showed the way to find the map of the universe. Toad tails and bat wings are not the ingredients of a nouvelle cuisine of past times. They are a cocktail of alkaloids that magicians and witches used in order to accede to the world of energies. The red mushroom on which Alice sat and which took her to Wonderland is not a narrative device, but the echo of a millinery tradition handed on to our own day of the ritual use of the Amanita muscaria. Some ecologists theorize that the ritual use of this mushroom is the fundament of the entire Olympian mythology. They say it's the Soma, the magic drink related in all Indian scriptures, and the mushroom used by the Taoists in their mystic travelings. Robert Graves, the mythologist, has discovered that the initials of the six hypothetical ingredients of ambrosia, the food of the gods, form the word in Greek which means mushroom. It's hard to imagine that all those men who once went in search of illumination and which throughout human history had always been considered as illuminated minds could now be seen as pure and simple prehistorical drug addicts. Perhaps it would be interesting to be a little more curious about those cultures that have maintained untouched, in spite of repressions and pyres, the cognizance of the ritual use of these plants and of their purpose in obtaining knowledge and illumination. Illuminated by so much intuition, but coming from a culture where atypical states of mind, like illumination, are often considered as mental aberrations, we found ourselves in the middle of a road. It was the road that went from Puerto Escondito to Oaxaca, destination San Jose del Pacifico. Situated in the heart of the Zapoteca region, at an altitude of 3,000 meters, until 30 years ago, this little village of a few hundred inhabitants had been only a small group of huts. Then came the big invasion of American hippies who wanted to experience the hallucinogenic mushrooms. Others started the cultivations of marijuana, then of opium. The entire economy of a mountain people was disturbed. Bands of drug dealers began directing here their suspicious trades, exploiting the ignorance and the good faith of the Indios. The voice was spread that opium served to produce medicines and that battles against its cultivation were to be attributed to the big pharmaceutical houses, who now saw menaced the market of their newfound chemicals. It's only a plant like any other, people thought. What could they know about heroin? So they started to construct the refineries and then started the murders. The soldiers came and the Federals came. They burned everything. They arrested hundreds of people. The drug dealers paid and came out. The Indians are still in the prison. Now the plantations don't exist anymore and people are again living and trying to survive with their own work. After all the uproar, silence has finally come back amongst these mountains. These are the mists where the shamans have lived. It's said that when the night falls and the stars come out, while everybody is asleep, they come and they roam around. They spy and they accomplish their missions of aggression 
or cure. If you ask, people will tell you that they don't exist. <laughs> ¿Para qué quieren los brujos? Para, para saber cómo curan. Ah, en San Miguel se encuentra. Sí. San Miguel, su tutepe aquí adelante. Ay, ay. Aquí the no shamans are always aquí in the no place hay... nearby. Allá, otros pueblos, sí. ¿Y curanderos? También. Curen en San Miguel y curen... No one will ever show you to them. People are scared. And they don't want to joke with these things. In this place lives a couple of very respected young healers. He comes from the north, a place near the border with the United States. One day, he got ill from malaria. He was going to die, but a shaman cured him. Now he himself has learned how to cure. He learned from the healers. He learned from the Eni doctors. He learned from the mushrooms and from the peyote. He cures with plants, with the earth, with prayers. His wife is German. She escaped from Europe in search of a different way to live with the world that surrounds her, with nature and with herself. Now she's a healer too. She helps her husband. She assists the pregnant women. She cures newborn babies and gives out vaccines. They have three beautiful children, a little house that seems out of a fairy tale, and a sincere smile on their faces. They don't smoke, they don't drink, and they pray a lot, appealing to a Catholic God, just a little converted. It's almost difficult to believe that they exist, that they could be true. Aquí, por ejemplo, a San José Pacífico llega mucha gente de otros países del mundo, donde hay un hambre grande espiritual, ¿no? que sienten que hay cierto hueco adentro, como que no encuentran la respuesta en su cultura. No existe, está muy, muy frío, podemos decir, ¿no? Entonces buscan y salen y buscan algo que les puede dar esta respuesta, ¿no? Y hemos visto unos que les fue muy mal, porque vienen enfermos. Vamos a decir, son enfermos de la suicida donde salen, como yo salí enferma. ¿eh? Yo en el momento no me di cuenta, yo no dije, pues yo estoy enferma, ¿no? Pero yo tenía que salir, yo sabía que tengo que salir. Si me quedo ahí, pues como que me voy a acabar. Tenía este sentimiento adentro, ¿no? Y pues sabemos, ¿no? Hay mucho movimiento, hubo antes, no sé cómo será ahorita, a la India, ¿no? A la Asia, estamos buscando algo que, algo que llena ese hueco o algo que nos contesta esa pregunta, ¿no? También igual aquí en México hemos visto mucha gente que llega, llega con una enfermedad bien tremenda adentro. Pero lo primero que hacen, comer mucho peyote o comer hongos y sin preparación. Ni saben siquiera que están enfermos, ¿no? Entonces se confrontan ellos solos con una enfermedad grande o con un hoyo grande. Y hay unos que no aguantan, que se echan un brinco por un barranco o se echan un brinco de frente de un coche o acaban en el suicidio. O se acaban como animales o... No saben, uy, qué cosa pasa, ¿no? Ah, no, hombre, viene cantidad. En muchos países. Creo que de todo el mundo vienen... Pues a comer honguitos nomás vienen. Y a pasear ahí están. Van a donde quieren por ahí a pasear. ¿Cómo estuvo la, la historia del, del señor uh, que, que siempre viene de México, el gordo? Ah, sí, dice que fue a San Sebastián. Y cuando llegó una tarde, como de estas horas creo que llegó. Le dije, ¿o dónde fue? A San Sebastián. Dice, Mire lo que traigo, pero unos hongos como de ese tamaño. Traiba tres, tres nada más traiba. Le dije, ¿y qué se los va a comer todo? Sí, dice. Le dije, pero es mucho. No, hombre, dice, yo me los como. Le dije, si los va a comer ahora en la noche, Juan. No, dice, lo voy a comer como a las, como a las cuatro de la mañana. Bueno, le dije, pues ahí lo voy a visitar temprano. Bajé, bajé como a las 7, creo. No, no estaba. Bajé como a las 10, no estaba. La, como a las 11, ¿no? Pues que no venir de, de mi aguatlán, que traigo unas piñas, 
Dijo, ¿dónde fue? Volando, dice, llegué en, en mi Aguatlán y ahí te traigo estas piñas. Pero no sé cómo sí, llegó allá. Pasa. El pasajero se fue, ¿verdad? Sí. Para que... Lo que vi uno de volar. <risa> Thirty years ago, a young student of anthropology of the Yucla decides to go to Mexico to complete a research amongst the natives. His name is Carlos Castaneda. The casual meeting of a Yaqui shaman will transform the neophyte and zealous anthropologist into the apprentice of shamanism. The first book he writes about his experience is in 1968. It's the years of Kerouac, of Hess, the age of the flower children, of universal love. In those times, a new magic philosophy is contraposing the ecstatic thoughts of the Indian philosophy. This magic philosophy has no more the aim of annihilating the self, but that of an accurate individual study of the manifold possibilities of the human mind, as well as of the powers and the energies dispersed in the universe. The first book is an unexpected success. As the years pass and the delusion of the universalistic ideal grows, the figure of Castaneda, little by little, becomes a real cult object. The other two books that he writes in the meantime create a trilogy. They're translated into all languages and they cause a sensation in the world. Thousands of young people, especially from the nearby United States, start to pour into Mexico with the same passion with which they poured into India when they read Hess. The use of hallucinogenic plants, which cause no ordinary states of conscience, and the search of a way to stop the world in order to penetrate that other parallel universe, which is the world of magic, stirs up passionate discussions. The idyll ends. With the fourth book, many of the readers feel cheated and tricked. The stories he's telling are too absurd to be credible and they decide to abolish the figure of Castaneda and to abate his work. Nevertheless, that doesn't stop him from writing many other books, which continue to sell around the world, confirming in this way the hypotheses of a cynical commercial operation. Levi Brühl, who recently dedicated an essay to Castaneda, maintains that in front of the message proposed by him, whose context tends to disturb the steadiness of our opinions, a power like that of the United States has tried to defend itself by discrediting Castaneda himself. Hypotheses apart, 30 years have passed and young people still go to Mexico following the suggestions received from his books. It's said that Federico Fellini wanted to make a film about one of his books and that they met, they talked, and Castaneda gave him an appointment in Mexico, one to which he never went. Más bien, muy, muy común, ella era vendido en las, en, en 
las hierberías, donde vender plantas medicinales, se conseguía. Pero se empezó a traficar, se empezó a vender y empezaron a comercializar y, y entonces se perdió también hasta la esencia. O sea que como hablábamos, son, tienen dos caras, ¿no? como puede ser bueno, como puede ser malo este cactus. Igual el hongo aquí es usado igual. Sí lo probé, perdió el tiempo. Me golpeé y tocó mi costilla en una piedra por ahí. Pues me operaron los honguitos y con esa nomás. Sentí que me rajaron aquí con un cuchillo así. Salía sangre bastante, así sentía yo pues. Y una mujer me metió la mano así. Sacaba un gordito medio verde así. El otro día amanecí, pero bien triste. ¿Por qué triste? Pues porque me dolía mucho el cuerpo. Y como iba subiendo el sol, ¿Mm? se iba quitando, quitando, así. Ya cuando era las 12 del día, ya se quitó todo. Colonized, civilized, and torn from the places of their origins, Mexico's ethnic groups for many years have risked facing the same end as the American Indians, who are now almost totally reduced to a sheer folkloristic phenomenon. Like the Mazateki people, for example, enormous disturbances have mutated, in a few hundred years, the identity of these people. The Spanish conquest, the massive evangelization, and the deporting of one-fourth of the population for the construction of the Alamon Dyke, of which you're seeing the pictures borrowed from Eni's repertory, have seriously menaced bringing these people into an identity crisis. It's curious to discover how they managed to compensate their oral tradition, partly lost, by rescuing all those archetypal forms which were the basis of their culture. Among these, the shaman's direct study of mushrooms, Lacking the ability to refer to a culture of magic, they go back to their origins in search of the voice of the divinity, the voice of nature. And here we are in Joutla de Jiménez, a place lost in the middle of the mountains of the Sierra Mazateca halfway between Mexico City and Oaxaca. The first who came here in the 50s were Mr. and Mrs. Wasson, two American mycologists. When they arrived, the road didn't exist. To travel 80 kilometers, they had to walk for two days instead of the usual five hours. And amongst this people of the Uto or Mega language, they met an old woman, a healer, who had the biblical name of Maria Sabina. Maria Sabina and her miracles, achieved with the magic mushrooms, are today famous throughout the world. She's no longer alive, and Huautla has become a sort of big shack where at every corner they sell mushrooms and rituals for tourists who are in search of mystic shivers. Our collaboration with the Institute of Indigenous People and the good faith of those who really came to learn saved us. 
Doña Chabelita saved us. After that, she observed us for a long time and listened what we had to say. She sent us to her personal healer, Don Ponciano. He's 75 years old, and he's a farmer. He started using the mushrooms 40 years ago after his wife got seriously ill. She was about to die, and he had no money for the doctors or the healers. He did it all by himself. The mushrooms explained to him how to do it, and they taught him everything he knows. He only added some paternosters, some prayers in the Mazateki language, and some songs invented by the mangling of the Mexican national anthem. And it worked. He accompanied us to look for the mushrooms. And when night came, he had an old woman to cure. He had his prayers, his songs, and his dance. He spoke to us with the words we were able to understand. In Mazategui, of course. Don Ponciano doesn't speak Spanish. Don Ponciano doesn't talk to the tourists. Don Ponciano is a shaman. Hear them, he said. Hear the mushrooms. They are the flash of God. They speak and they answer. But the spirit has to be pure, and abstinence and fasting are obligatory, before and after. We accompanied him to visit an ill lady who lived in a little house in the countryside. They received him with great respect and esteem, and they told him about the ills from which the old woman suffered. Probably because of her old age, and because of her precarious conditions of living, the old woman felt very exhausted, enfeebled. She had pains in the bones and she couldn't sleep. After he'd heard the long and detailed report told by the family, Don Ponciano decided to cure her. He prescribed a day of abstinence from meat and from any kind of alcoholic drink, and he told her about the time of fasting that was necessary. Then he gave her an appointment in his house for the following night. To cure the old lady, he was going to use the mushrooms that he'd picked up that day. Hemos visto que sí, realmente tienen un poder curativo bien grande y son de mucho respeto. Hemos visto también que que cuando lo usábamos, porque lo usamos un buen tiempo en, en nuestra vida, y a través de ellos vimos que primeramente ciertos cambios en nosotros. Y hemos visto y hemos sabido de muchas personas que lo usan y lo han usado con mucho beneficio. Pero como es buena, puede ser malo también, depende del uso que le dan. Hemos visto personas que lo usan mal y les ha sido mal. Les ha ido muy mal incluso hasta la muerte. Han llegado hasta la muerte. Pero muchas personas lo han usado con mucho beneficio, incluso nosotros. Nosotros lo usábamos como para que nos dé dirección en nuestra vida espiritual, que nos dijera por dónde que teníamos que hacer. Y hasta cuando uno anda bajo el estado de, del hongo, bajo el efecto del hongo, uno puede ver con otros ojos, uno puede ver mucho más allá que normalmente. Se pueden detectar dónde la persona está mal y hasta por qué está mal.
mushrooms are not always essential for the healer. Sometimes, as with this lady, it's enough to do a purification with eggs, give her some medical plants and encourage her with some kind words. The curandero thus is not only a medicine man, he's also a psychologist and the person who tries to keep in harmony the elements of the microcosmos in which he lives. The night after, as planned, the old lady arrived at Don Ponciano's house. She had already done the checkup with the eggs the day before, and Don Ponciano decided that he had to do only a divination with maize. He wanted to make sure that the ritual would proceed without problems. <laughs> A nosotros nos ayudó mucho el hongo porque a través del hongo Dios nos habló, nos sabía. Nos habló de, de cuál es el camino de Dios, cuál es el camino, por qué están enfermas las personas, por qué estamos enfermos nosotros. The passage to Mexico and the use of the power plants becomes perhaps a way to discover those parts of us that we've forgotten. A way to discover that ineffable thing which will continue to be forever, beyond this world and beyond our lives, and which we might call genetic memory or silent consciousness, like Castaneda does. Perhaps because beyond theories and certainties, there are dimensions and rituals which our imagination and very physical and psychological makeup cannot do without. The ritual in this manner becomes something more, something that helps us to go beyond the habitual sequences of our mind, of our attitudes and our ways of living. It helps us to find the space inside of us for something which is ineffable and which we have distractingly left out in order that it comes back and recreates the equilibrium. This little indistinct and ineffable thing is us. It's that little part of us which no distraction, no joy, and no catastrophe will ever change. Con el efecto del del hongo puedes ver este las corrientes de energía en las plantas, la vida, ¿no? Cómo se mueve en energía esa sin forma. También adentro de la gente puedes ver dónde está opaco, donde no hay circulación, ¿no? Donde no hay Y todo esto um, ganas distinguir bien, ¿no? Y hasta puedes ver de lejos cuando llega una gente que sí es um, muy opaco o muy claro. Cómo está su estado de purificación, lo puedes ver de lejos. 
Y el hongo es, no es la respuesta última, es un medio nada más. No es el hongo la respuesta. Es como, yo lo veo como un devoto a una puerta, a una sala cerrada. Y tú te puedes asomar y ves a, a través de un devoto, ves un mundo de vida, ves un mundo mucho más claro, mucho más La cosa es cuando baja el efecto, el efecto de hongo, te quedas afuera de la puerta todavía. Entonces te queda, tomas otra droga o buscas otro, otra vez otro viaje de hongo y siempre empiezas a buscar cosas, pero nomás para asomarte y ver por adentro y el más objetivo ver cuál es la puerta y abrirla y entrar. ¿no? Porque siento que tenemos la capacidad adentro, lo que vemos con el hongo podemos experimentar nosotros. Tenemos esa capacidad de rodearnos. ¿sí? Porque con la filosofía, según yo lo entiendo, que llega más fácil que tu cerebro que otros tiempos están de mí. No pues es cuestión que nosotros regresamos a nuestra origen de formación, que tenemos toda esta capacidad dentro de nosotros mismos. ¿no? Más que le hemos pedido porque nos estamos ensuciando, nos estamos contaminando constantemente. Hey, katakin, hey. Hey, katakin, hey. Sí, hey. Pero si comemos estas plantas con la intención así nomás para diversión podemos este, cortarnos con este mismo cuchillo que nos podría sería abrir brecha para ver más allá nos podemos cortar y nos podemos tener. After the fasting and the purification, the shaman and the patient eat the mushrooms, and in that way begin a difficult and tortuous journey together. In that journey, the shaman takes on the responsibility of the troubles and sufferings of the person he's trying to help. It's in the depth of these sufferings that mysteriously the catharsis occurs, and then the journey back begins. But let's pause for a moment and think, like we've already done other times in the course of this strange documentary. The biggest organism of the planet ever discovered is an underground mushroom whose diameter is a few kilometers. It's been found recently in Mexico. And among all other live organisms with which men have shared the planet, it's always been the mushroom that for the human being had the most superior role. In spite of all our frenzy and passion for speed, we often don't know that inside of our bodies exist particles that move faster than anything we could imagine. The nucleus of the atoms that compose our organism contain particles which move at the speed of 60,000 kilometers per second. These particles permit us to exist and to theorize as they permit the world that surrounds us to appear solid. And perhaps the ancient wise men already try to accelerate the particles of their bodies and transform themselves into light. The black holes which condense the energy and matter until they become something infinitely small are in some way the corridors through which every single thing loses its physical consistence that belongs to a definite space and time. And, at least for us, they're somewhat of an abstraction. Once past the confines of what physicians call the horizon of events, everything regresses to an indistinct and non-temporal form, which we imagine as being infinitely compressed and infinitely little. With a flight of fantasy, the black hole becomes then the door between the macrocosm and the microcosm. And who knows, perhaps our planet, 
Our solar system and our galaxy are nothing else but molecules that constitute the body cells of another man, who in this moment, probably not aware of anything, is standing at the bar and sipping his aperitif. Este hongo es, es, es de mucho respeto para los que lo conocen, para los que lo usan. Lo tienen como una planta sagrada, ¿no? que nada más lo tocan para ciertos casos, con una intención, con ciertos fines, los que lo saben usar. After resting for a few hours, the patient and the healer wake up. The therapy is almost over. With grains of cacao and with a feather, 
which symbolizes the soul, the healer constructs a doll, which represents the old woman. Certainly, these rituals, these feats, and the use of plants, which alter our state of consciousness, may create inside of those who belong to the Western culture a feeling of discomfort and alienation. They appear very often to us as far-off echoes of a dark and distant past of our history, a past of which, all considered, we know very little. Nevertheless, if in a moment of distraction, of sadness, or of an interior silence, the grandeur of it all is revealed to us, then that grandeur and that brief moment of bliss will become a worm which will never let us sleep again. Our beautiful concepts, which tell us a lot but don't explain, will appear miserable and insignificant. Solitude, inner silence, sadness. Like many other states of our spirit, we're used to thinking of in negative terms. These turn out to be preparatory steps to illumination and fullness, important strides towards understanding the unknowable and fulfilling our search. Our search for peace, well-being and harmony turns out to be part of our mental map, but not part of the territory in which we exist. With the doll and with two eggs, Don Ponciano does the last purification to the old woman. Then he hands over everything to her. Now she will be the one to accomplish the last deed. She will go to a sacred place, not far away from there, and she will pray and beg to heal up. Then she will bury everything in a little cavity. Nobody knows whether the old woman's bones are now going to hurt less than before. What is sure is that from today, she will look at the world with more curiosity, with more attention, and with a little more respect. And perhaps this will prolong her life. But who is a shaman? This is a shaman. Sometimes when you see them on the ground and you hear them joking and playing, it seems as if you've happened upon a cheerful company of slothful and good-tempered fellows. Beyond all the romantic thoughts that we like to have of them, and beyond the halo of mystery with which our literature enshrouds them, here they are, human beings as real as we are, and yet so different, very different. As if they had one more gear, as if they had the key to penetrate the inconceivable and use it for their own purposes. It's strange. When you see them for the first time, they seem so imposing and so immense. Then, little by little, you discover that they're like you. They feel sleepy, hungry, bored, just like you do. The delusion is so great that you'd like to run away and go back to your books. Everything seems feigned, everything seems a big fraud. But the key is there. And you'll find it if you don't run away. And if you can take the blow of discovering that your idols are like you, then little by little, you'll find out it's not true, that they're absolutely not like you. There's another possible reality beyond appearances. You'll discover that these people manage to do things that you will never be able to do, and that they live their lives with a fullness you could not ever imagine. And if you start wishing to become like them, beware, be sure, it's not going to be an easy task at all.